Economics is a study that is intertwined with man's life. Man makes many decisions in his day-to-day -day life. For anybody who has started or is willing to start into the vibrant world of economics, there are certain notions that one must remember. Just like how one cannot study math without knowing the principle of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, etc., the foundation of economics lies in the 10 principles of economics. Not just in academics, knowledge of these 10 principles allow even a layman to make better and more rational judgments in their daily life. Gregory Mankiw, in his text Principles of Economics, described these 10 principles of economics. They are as follows. People face trade-offs. The cost of something is what you give up to get it. Rational people think at the margin. People respond to incentives. Trade can make everyone better off. Markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity. Governments can sometimes improve economic outcomes. The standard of living depends on a country's production. Price rise when the government prints too much money. Society faces a short-run trade-off between inflation and unemployment. In these series of videos, each day we will take into account two of these principles and discuss in details what significance these principles could hold for anybody interested in economics. Today's video is the last of this series where I explain the 10 principles of economics. In today's video, we will be concentrating on the two final principles of economics, namely the ninth and 10th one. Number nine. Prices rise when the government prints too much money. Number 10, society faces a short-run trade-off between inflation and unemployment. Mankiw's ninth principle of economics is prices rise when the government prints too much money. Have you ever wondered why the government does not simply print more money when it runs out? Doesn't that seem like the easiest way out of debt? I mean, we cannot print money at our home because that would be illegal, but surely the government can, and sometimes it actually does. Then why does it not do it as often as we expect it to? Is there some hidden problem to it? Let's go back in history to find out. In January 1921, a daily newspaper in Germany cost 0 0.30 marks. Less than two years later, in November 1922, the same newspaper costs 7000000 marks. A big jump. All other prices in the economy rose by similar amounts. This episode is one of history's most spectacular examples of inflation. An increase in the overall level of prices in the economy. By inflation, we mean an increase in the low overall level of prices in the economy. In almost all cases of large or persistent inflation, the culprit is the growth in quantity of money. When a government creates large quantities of nation's money, the value of money falls. In Germany, in the early 1920s, when prices were on average tripling every month, the quantity of money was also tripling every month. If the money supply increases faster than real output, then ceteris paribus, inflation will occur. If a, country's pr if a country prints money and causes inflation, then ceteris paribus, the currency will devalue against other currencies. For example, the hyperinflation in Germany of 1922-23 caused the German D-mark to devalue against the currencies who didn't have inflation. The reason is that with the German currency buying fewer goods, you need more German DMARCs to buy the same quantity of US goods. An easy way to explain this phenomenon is if we think this way. If you print more money, the amount of goods won't change. However, if you print money, households will have more cash and more money to spend on goods. If there is more money chasing the same amount of goods, firms will just put off prices. This results in a rise in prices, and it comes from something called the quantity theory of money. In monetary economics, the quantity theory of money, or QTN, 
states that the general price level of goods and services is directly proportional to the amount of money in circulation or money supply. The theory was originally formulated by Polish mathematician Nicholas Copernicus in 1517 and was influentially restated by philosophers John Locke, David Hume, John Bowden, and by economists Milton Friedman and Anna Swartz in A Monetary History of the United States, published in 1963. We shall discuss more about this theory in other videos. However, while using the quantity theory of money to justify inflation, we make an assumption that might otherwise get overlooked. To rectify this, we adjust our situation. If the, in the real world, it is possible if the government printed money, people would decide to just save extra money and therefore prices wouldn't automatically rise. However, to simplify the link between money supply and inflation, let us assume that consumers are willing to spend the extra amount of money. Also, if you expect inflation to rise, you have an incentive to spend it rather than see the value of your money fall. If the government prints to print too much money and inflation gets out of hand, investors will not trust the government and it will be hard for the government to borrow anything at all. Hence, economists always think before printing money. The above analysis is something of a simplification. For example, in the real world, it is hard to measure the money supply. There are many different measures of money from M0 narrow money to M4 wide money. Also, in liquidity trap, printing money may not cause inflation. However, this provides a rough explanation why printing money usually reduces the value of money, causing prices to increase. Mankiw's 10th principle of economics is, society faces a short-run trade-off between inflation and unemployment. We already know what is inflation, so let's now define unemployment. Unemployment, according to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which is OECD, is persons above a specified age, usually above 15, not being in paid employment or self-employment, but currently available for work during the reference period. Although the higher level of prices is in the long run, the primary effect of increasing the quantity of money, the short-run story is more complex and controversial. In fact, this might be one of the more controversial topics among economists than any other principles. Most economics describe the short-run effects of monetary injections as follows. Increasing the amount of money in the economy stimulates the overall spending and thus the demand for goods and services. Higher demand may over time cause firms to raise their prices but in the meantime, it also encourages them to hire more workers and produce a large quantity of goods and services. More hiring means lower un unemployment. This line of reasoning leads to one final economy-wide trade-off, a short-run trade-off between inflation and unemployment. This short-run trade-off between inflation and unemployment is illustrated in two dimensions by the short-run Phillips curve. The Phillips curve is an economic concept developed by A.W. Phillips stating that inflation and unemployment have a stable and inverse relationship. The theory claims that with the economic growth comes inflation, which in turn should lead to more jobs and less unemployment. Although some economists still question these ideas, most accept that society faces a short-run trade-off between inflation and unemployment. This simply means that over a period of a year or two, many economic policies push inflation and unemployment in opposite direction. Policymakers face this trade-off regardless of whether inflation and unemployment both start out at high levels, as they did in the early 1980s, at low levels, as they did in the early, late 1990s, or someplace in between. This short-run trade-off plays a key role in the analysis of business cycle. The irregular and largely unpredictable fluctuations in economic activity as measured by the production of goods and services or the number of people employed. 
policy makers can exploit the short run trade off between inflation and unemployment using various policy instruments. By changing the amount of the government spends, the amount of taxes and the amount of money it prints, the policy makers can influence the overall demand for goods and services. Changes in demand in turn influence the combination of inflation and unemployment that the economy experiences in the short run. Because these instruments of economic policy are potentially so powerful, how policymakers should use them to control the economy, if at all, is a subject of continuing debate.